while everyone's while everyone is logging on. Um, I'm Dioanne, and I'd like to welcome you all to the talk with Telly that we'll, we will hear from in just a bit. Um, and the event is actually hosted tonight by Women in Big Data, Bay Area Chapter, and the Girls in Tech San Francisco Chapter, which I'm a member of. Um, I do uh, put together events for both um, groups. And when I heard that um, Telly was interested in speaking to the Women in Big Data group, I thought this was a great time to have the Girls in Tech group be a part of it. And um, I know we really appreciate uh, listening to Telly tonight. And um, so here we all are. And to start off, I'll talk a bit about uh, the Women in Big Data group. Um, let's see if I can, oh. And uh, uh, Women in Big Data started back in 2015 with only 15 members. And up to now we have over 18,000 members uh, in 41 chapters worldwide on six continents. And here's a bit about our mission and what our goals are. Um, and then kind of the profile of our membership um, being that we're called Women in Big Data. Majority of the members are in the data science field um, and IT technical. We have like software and data engineers uh, machine learning and AI. Um, and then with that said, there is a, a good percent, about 22, that are outside of the technical uh, field. And so these are possibly members that come to us um, to get technical training, want to see what it's like to be a part of um, the tech industry um, and get mentored and possibly networked. And here's a bit of the stats, kind of the reason why um, we uh, are out there and why we're important is because uh, women are underrepresented in uh, the data science um, and data professional fields. So we're roughly about 26%. And here's like other stats um, that you could find on our website. And how to get involved, you can be a community member, so you can attend our meetups, um, our trainings and workshops. You can be a volunteer, so if you have some special skills, you can offer training. Um, you can also help uh, with putting together events, like what I do, or you can mentor um, and be part of the networking. You can also be a program partner or a funding partner and donor. So if any of your companies are interested, um, they can partner with us. And some of the ways we help our members um, is with leadership development, outreach, uh, skills development, mentorship, and networking. And here's a list of some of our local partners. So a lot of the local chapters work with their local, the local companies. Um, and here's um, some pictures from some of the activities before the pandemic, since these are all in person. Um, so we have technical training, networking events, um, panels, presentations, and other uh, workshops. And so um, currently our events are virtual, but we're slowly moving back to hybrid and then uh, possibly in person again. As for the Bay Area chapter, um, here's a couple of events going on. Uh, we do have, I think the application process is currently open for a mentoring program, getting from here to there. So that's for women who are managing teams right now. Um, I think it's like the first level of management um, or managing projects. And if you wanna go up to like a senior level role, um, this would be for you. Um, so that's going to start soon. So if you're interested, uh, please apply. Uh, we had our data science Olympians uh, program that just wrapped up. 
And that's where a team of data scientists got together and they worked on projects and did a presentation at the end. Um, so if you are interested in joining that next year, uh, check in on our website, uh, possibly later this year for any dates. And um, we have a speed mentoring event scheduled. We're working on scheduling that in the fall. So look for that and um, check back in on our meetup site or any local or virtual events. And then here's other mentoring programs within the Women in Big Data organization. These are um, the Emerging Technologist is for first um, with women who have like one to two years experience in technology. Um, and then Mentor in Tech is for anyone outside of this country. I don't know if anyone here is not in the US, but um, Mentor in Tech International is for those in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So if you're there, then you could apply to that. And then here's how to get a hold of us. If you have any um, questions, uh, we do have local chapters. Um, so if you're not from the Bay Area, or if you are from the Bay Area, you could find the contact person to the local chapter. And then if you're not from the Bay Area, you could find the contact information to whatever chapter is near you. Um, and then more information on our website, find us on LinkedIn, on our LinkedIn group, and then you could follow us on Twitter and Instagram. And with that, I'm gonna hand things off to Sudeshna, who's with Girls in Tech. Hi everyone, uh, just one minute. Sorry. <laughs> okay, it's so nice to see everyone here. Just yeah. Welcome. Um, so, welcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Everyone can see my presentation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, my name is Sudeshna. I'm with Girls in Tech, San Francisco chapter. Uh, so I will uh, briefly go through who we are and what we do and how you can get involved. So our mission is to eliminate the gender gap in technology by providing experiences and education opportunities that leave people feeling inspired, confident, empowered, prepared, and connected. So we have 54 chapters and in 37 countries and six continents with about 70,000 global members. Uh, our recent chapter launched in Tanzania, Dubai, Guatemala, and Vietnam. We, uh, as you can see, like we're spread all over the world and it's uh, all volunteer based. So we love, we're always open to have volunteers. So we'd love for you to get involved in any way possible. So here's what our local team looks like. We have uh, two managing directors and various uh, team members and different committees. Uh, and we are a pretty tight knit group and uh, would uh, welcome any new interest in committee members. So uh, DON will paste the uh, links and the resources here for partner opportunities. If you want to get involved with us to partner up with an event such as this um, or anything else you might want to do together, as well as volunteer opportunities to volunteer as part of the chapter. Um, you can apply to do mentorship, scholarships, um, really like anything that you can think of to uh, collaborate. And of course, um, like social media. And our next um, event is actually in September, on September 14th, uh, on winning the battle against burnout. So that's very exciting. And after work, so it should be pretty convenient. Um, so again, um, DON will get the link to the event right for registration there. And our um, other uh, upcoming events are in September. Um, so and October as well. So we have a uh, data visualization in September, a software engineering at scale 101 in October. And we're very excited and working hard to organize our Hacking for Humanity, uh, which is our annual hackathon from Friday, October 14th to Sunday, 
October 16th. So please sign up if you're interested. Uh, and of course, follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram if you are not already. So with that, thank you for listening and I will pass it off to Regina. Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to have everyone participate today. I'm Regina and I have both a tech and business background educationally and professionally. I was trained as an electrical engineer a long time ago in a faraway galaxy and uh, basically uh, wrote command and control software for airplanes and satellites then uh, down in Los Angeles. And then I came to Silicon Valley seeking my fame and fortune, still working on those two. So having said that, um, I'm really honored. Oh, I've been with, before I introduced Telly, I've been with Women in Big Data since we were 1,500 people. Uh, so very excited to see the 18K uh, uh, trajectory that we've been on. I've held roles as a Silicon Valley chapter director. I've been on the board and now I'm an advisory to the board. So with that, I'm really honored to introduce Telly today. I've known her for decades as we've both had careers in Silicon Valley. Telly received a bachelor's degree in computer science from the University of Utah and a PhD in computer science from Caltech. No small feat, Telly. Uh, she moved to Silicon Valley to work in the chip industry. She's held senior technical management positions at Actel and malleable technologies, as well as senior roles at several startup technology companies. Telly is probably most famous for us in that she is the former CEO and president of the Anita Borg Institute for Women in Technology. She co-founded the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing with Anita Borg in 1994 and joined the Anita Borg Institute in 2002. In 2004, Telly co-founded the National Center for Women and Information Technology. She has served as a secretary treasurer for the Association of Computing Machinery and is the co-chair of the ACM Distinguished Member Committee. She was a member of the National Science Foundation Advisory Committees and she also serves on advisory boards of Caltech's Information Science and Technology and Illuminate Ventures. She's also a member of the Forbes Executive Women's Board. Telly, I learned a lot by reading your Wikipedia page. Um, with numerous awards to her name, she is currently CEO of Telly Whitney Consulting, focused on bringing diversity to companies sits on four boards, including AI for All, and most recently was nominated to the National Academy of Engineering, as in, this, as in 2022. Academy membership honors those who have made outstanding contributions to engineering research, practice, or education. Election of new Academy members is the culmination of a year-long process. So before I hand this off to you, Telly, to share your inspirational stories with us, is there anything key that I missed? <laughs> because there's a long list here of amazing achievements. No, you did great, Regina, thank you. All right, well, with that, I'm most honored to hand the stage to you. And I'm very excited that you've taken the time to be with us and to inspire us. Okay, so I'm going to take just a minute to get this. Um, uh, here we go. Okay, so share. Whew, hey, it worked. I'm so excited. Technology is so funny. It's uh, one never knows. Well, it's it's an honor and privilege to be here. I'm very excited. Um, I'm yeah, what I'm going to be talking about today is how you can have the best career of your life. And I'm focusing on what I call the five C's, where if you follow this, I can promise you that you will have the career that you dreamed of. And what I'm going to talk about is examples from my own career, and we will have plenty of time for questions. So what are the five C's? Um, courage, confidence, communication, curiosity, and creativity. 
I'm sure that at least one of these resonates with you as you think about what you want to do next. I can't, as Regina said, I came to Silicon Valley for the promise of technology. I've been, I've been very caught up in these technology revolutions for a long time. And I spent a number of years at startups. At, then I joined, I took over the, um, what became the Anita Borg Institute, and which was also a startup. I mean, if you look at the theme of my entire life, it's really entrepreneurship and taking risks. This, I love this picture. <clears throat> it's in Nepal. I went to Nepal in the mid nineties. And yes, I was a little younger then. Um, we climbed up to 18,000 feet. And if you ever have a chance to go there, it is breathtakingly beautiful. I mean, you can't turn around without seeing just gorgeous mountains. Um, but walking, you, walking up, took a lot of time. It was really hard. <laughs> and so I went step by step and we just continued to go. And that step by step is something that I take seriously. It's really the way that I approached almost everything that I do. You can get there if you just keep going. I also, I will say, um, went to Africa in June. And so I've incorporated a few pictures from Africa. There's a link at the end of this presentation, which I think will be distributed as a PDF if you want to see the whole suite, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't help myself. I wanted to add some of these beautiful African pictures, but I'm going to start with courage. And there's nothing that exemplifies courage more than a lion, contrary to what the Wizard of Oz tells us. And for me, courage is about taking risks. It's about really deciding to go for it. And this has been like the courage and taking risks has been the guiding theme for my career. It's also important to think of courage as the courage to speak up. When you're the only one in the room that looks like you, which for many of us happens way too often, that courage to speak your truth and talk about what's going on is really important. And that is often what courage means to me. I'm gonna start, use as an example, the starting of the Grace Hopper celebration. Anita Borg, who's shown in these pictures, was a very close friend of mine. Um, we moved to Silicon Valley about the same time, but although we worked in very different technologies, we decided to create this conference. And, Neither of us had any idea how do you create a conference from scratch, but we were in Palo Alto for the and with a sheet of paper at a coffee shop looking at each other scared. I mean, we really weren't sure what to do. And then we started. It was and it certainly was taking a big risk risk to try and do this in particular. Could we could we sustain it? The good news is that we were not alone. The Computing Research Association, or CRA, was the fiscal sponsor for that first conference. The National Science Foundation provided money for scholarships for students to attend. Every single woman, senior woman, that we asked to speak at that first conference said yes. And two of those speakers went on to um, receive a Turing Award. Uh, they were the first two women to receive Turing Awards. And the Turing Award, for those that don't know, is really the Nobel Prize within the computing community. But what I remember most about this conference was that Anita and I were at the hotel. And it, there was about 500 people coming. Of those, about five were men, the rest were women. So we were watching the stream of women pour through the hotel. I'd never seen so many women in my life. And as I looked down and saw the people joining us, I thought, this is my tribe. This is where I belong. We didn't, when you take a risk like the one we did with Grace Hopper, you never know if it's going to catch. Sometimes risks peter out. That's just part of the package. Sometimes they take off when they meet a real need. And the Grace Hopper celebration met a real need. Here's a picture in 2019. We were, and that was the last time 
we were together in person, it was about 26,000 people. Certainly, it, um, the, you know, people came because they really wanted to. I understand they're going to hold it in a couple of weeks in person for the first time, although they still have a virtual op op option. So if you look broadly speaking at the Grace Hopper celebration, you can see what, why it is so attractive. It's a conference that's designed by women for women. There's certainly a career fair. This, and at this point, it's actually known as a career fair. These are many companies trying to come and recruit all these talented women that come to the conference. For students, it's often the first place that they present their work as illustrated by the student poster session in the upper, at least my upper right. Um, we also have a lot of lunches that bring like-minded people together. This particular picture has the Latinas in computing, which was, you know, they, the Latinas in computing really started and worked hard to bring together women and to also recognize many talented senior women Latinas for, for many of the awards. As we, as we considered what to do with, with all these people who are working in academic institutions and industry, I became increasingly convinced that you really had to look at the culture of the technology organizations themselves. And so we introduced something called the Technical Executive Forum where we brought together senior leaders. And we had many um, industry meetings. So there was, the reason why Grace Hopper has grown and meets so many needs is because it's become large and there's a lot of different groups doing many different amazing things. But Grace Hopper celebration was always about the celebration. You can see the dance party in the lower right. And we had fun. We just always had fun. So that's what happened with the Grace Hopper celebration. The next C, is confidence. And this cheetah just sat there looking so confident. I couldn't, I just, I just love it. You know, confidence is one of these funny words because you know it when you see it. And probably the people that you think about who just exude confidence are mostly white men. I am, um, my board one time got, gave some feedback to me, this was quite a few years ago, that I needed to develop more of an executive presence. And I remember receiving that feedback thinking, okay, what does that mean? How do you develop executive presence? And it's, um, that's another word for being confident. And it just means that you, you exude that you believe in what you're doing. There's somebody, there's nobody who embodies this idea of being confident more than the former US CTO, Megan Smith. For those of you who came to the Grace Hopper celebration, you know that Megan was part of the conference for quite a few years um, while I was still there. And as she bounded or strutted onto the stage, she did, she exuded confidence. I mean, you know what confidence mean when you saw Megan. You can see her standing in the career fair surrounded by many of the conference attendees as she talked about what was most important. And so she's a great example of what it means to be confident. If you think about developing confidence in yourself, there's one thing that's very clear. You need to become very comfortable being uncomfortable because as your ideas, as you get to own them, at the beginning, you are gonna feel uncomfortable. And it's really standing up and saying, I believe this, that matters. So if you think about how do you develop confidence, one of the things that's most important is what a sponsor or advocate. You know, um, a sponsor is somebody who put, who believes in you who certainly gives you advice much like mentoring, but stands up for you. They put their own reputation on the line in recommending you, recommending you for speaking opportunities, recommend you for leadership opportunities, but they stand behind you and they believe in you. And it's, 
I'm, I've been doing a lot of interviewing for a book that I'm writing and without exception, the successful executives that I interviewed described that they had engaged in supportive advocates without exception. And yet for the survey that I released last fall, only 13% of the survey respondents said that they had a sponsor. So there's often a disconnect between what it takes to be really successful and what many of us experience. And that, that disconnect is even more true for women because all too often, many of the leaders at the organizations find people that look like them and they often, that's not a woman. My friend, Nora Denzel, who was a board member at Anita Borg says, it isn't who you know, it isn't what you know, but who knows what you know. And as you think about that and think about who could be your sponsor, you think about how to get in front of the influencers, the people that are making decisions about uh, at your company, uh, help them to understand what you're capable of. Let me tell you a little bit about my own experience um, with mentors and sponsors. My single most important um, sponsor was a man named Carver Mead. And yes, men, you will find if you're working in um, technology that is primarily men, probably often the best sponsors are men. Not exclusively, but that is really common. So Carver, as I said, was my PhD thesis advisor and he was famous by the time we were working together, but he always made time for me and his other students. We'd meet, he always said, focus on the science. He nurtured my work, which helped me to gain confidence, but he also asked challenging questions. But the reason why I call Carver my most important sponsor is that Carver introduced me to the leadership of the first three companies that I went to. He, he put his own reputation on the line as he introduced me to these people. And it was through those introductions that I, that I was able to take a journey that was really quite successful within the semiconductor startup community. In the middle of this is um, two of my most important sponsors. These Maria Clave, who many of you may know, she's the president of Harvey Mudd College, and Bill Wolf, who's the former president of NAE. Both of them were chairs of the board at the Anita Board Institute at different times. But during the times when they were chairs, they had my back. Maria was there in the, from the very beginning and she definitely had my back. But when we, the organization had challenging times, Maria would take me into a closed room and give me the challenging feedback that I needed to hear. Bill did similar things. And so finding people who will help you, but will be straight with you about what's working and what's not is really important. And then finally, Valerie Taylor, who I consider um, an important mentor. I've, I've known Valerie for many years. She's the CEO of the Center for Minorities and People with Disabilities, and I still serve on her board. She's also the director at the Argonne National Laboratory, so she balances two very different kinds of roles. But Valerie is great at, because of command is focused on underrepresented minorities, She's great at giving me feedback about, about how to, to talk about the communities that, that command it serves. And so I always go to Valerie with questions and she always, um, we find ways to help each other. So this is, so, I mean, these are my examples of how I developed an advocate. I would ask you to take just a minute and think about your own journey and think about who are your mentors and who are your advocates. And if you're not quite sure how to answer this question, I would encourage you to think about how do you find these people? Um, go out and ask to have coffee with somebody. Be prepared with really tough questions about the kinds of things that you're trying to figure out. Um, 
but spend time and energy to find people that can help you. It really, really matters. Okay, so um, the third C is something called communication. And I love this giraffe picture because the giraffes communicate with each other. They actually use their necks, they wrap around each other, and it's a way to communicate, to set boundaries. So it's, um, it's really important. You know, communication is an underappreciated skill. So many of the young women that I um, work with, they really felt, believed that if they did good work, it would be recognized. And here's the secret, communicating your ideas are as equally as important as developing the ideas. That may seem very counterintuitive, but really if you can't talk about what you did, it's really, it's hard to get the message across. When I was, um, one of my first jobs was at a company called Actel and we made programmable logic. It was, um, it was fun, I was a young engineer and John East was the president of Actel. John East was a semiconductor guy and all of, most of his team, the executive staff were also semiconductor and they were guys, <laughs> um, all of them. And part of what we needed to do was add software to the, um, to the, the software that we gave to our customers. And so I really wanted Actel to consider adding logic synthesis for those of you who know something about design. And um, I had a chance. I had a 10 minute slot on John East's um, agenda, his executive staff agenda. And I had a chance to pitch him to invest in this important software. And so I spent a lot of time talking about the goals. I mean, thinking about the goals trying to figure out how to tell the story about why we needed to incorporate logic synthesis to our, our product. And I got up and I, I felt like I waxed eloquently. I really got to the points. I made all of the one points that I really wanted to make and then I stopped. And there was dead silence. And John looked at me and he said, I don't get it. I don't get it. And it's, he actually approved the purchase because he believed in me, but it was an early lesson that it was, I needed to communicate. I needed to communicate those ideas. And it takes a lot of time and attention to develop the way, the way in which you're going to communicate an idea. This important lesson served me well years later when I was at the Anita Borg Institute, where I really was, I needed to articulate these ideas to a wide audience and why it mattered. I mean, it, it was core to my job. So it was, it was really important. So that's the third C. I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk about um, the founding of what at the time was called the Institute for Women in Technology. Anita Borg, as I've mentioned, was a very good friend of mine. Um, you can see us, we were backpacking up in Hetch Hetchy near Yosemite. And she, <clears throat> she started a nonprofit. At the time I was at a, a, a semiconductor startup called Malleable. But I, you know, we stayed in touch as she developed ideas about this new nonprofit. Shortly after she founded the organization, she was diagnosed with brain cancer. You know, I stepped down from Malleable. I had um, fin we were bought, it was, I was done. And so I tried to help Anita out as she was creating this nonprofit. Um, and then ultimately the board of trustees for, for what was IWT at the time, asked me to step in as, as CEO. I, I was terrified. I mean, I couldn't quite get this. I, my entire identity was as a technologist. I mean, I'd been VP of engineering. <clears throat> I, I had led engineering teams. 
<clears throat> but leading a nonprofit organization, excuse me, <clears throat> was not something that I had a lot of experience with. Um, so at first I said no, and then I thought about it, and then I said yes. So this was a pretty significant pivot for me to turn from working in technology to running a nonprofit. And um, if you talk to people, it is not uncommon for there to be a, a significant career pivot. It's important to embrace that pivot <clears throat> and to understand what to do. It was, you know, the best decision of my life. And it was hard. As we, I mean, what Anita had thought of in those early days of IWT, it wasn't sustainable and it didn't have the impact that we wanted to have. And so we took a step back and figured out what it was that what became the Anita Borg Institute needed to do. And curiosity was at the heart of that process. Uh, here you see a lion cub looking over the body of his mom, peering up, you know, exhibiting a lot of curiosity at all these strange people that are off in the distance looking at him. So while we thought about that um, as what was next for the Anita Borg Institute, curiosity was at our core. And just some of the questions that we thought about what helps students? What do, you know, what, how do we welcome students and what can we as an organization provide for them? What do industry professionals need? You know, at the very beginning, a lot of our core community were academics and they were very important. They brought a lot of students to the conference. But as we grew, we also wanted to ensure that we had content for the industry people. And, it was the people who attended the conference from industry just had a different approach. And so it took us some time to figure out how to solicit content for the, for the conference and other places. And so what can we provide that would attract um, industry professionals? And as a nonprofit, you always wanna work with other groups. What are they doing? I mean. My curiosity really wanted to know what the Society for Women Engineers was doing. Betty Shanahan, who was at the time was the CEO of SWE, and I worked a lot together and we, we gave talks at quite a few different conferences. It was a great way to learn what SWE was doing and they are a wonderful organization if any of you belong to them. Shortly after I was at um, Anita Borg Institute, um, somebody named Lucy Sanders and Bobby um, Schnabel came to me about an idea for NC Wit. I'm a co-founder of NC Wit. And I, I mean, I was very curious, what can they, there was, there was programs and processes that NC Wit could do that it would have been much harder for Anita Borg to do. And so, my curiosity about what or the other organizations were doing was certainly an important part of developing that first set of programs. If you look at the Anita Borg Institute, and this is just a brief history, Sisters was founded in 87, Grace Hopper was founded in 94. Um, I became CEO in 2002. We experimented and piloted many different kinds of programs. We held the first Grace Hopper in India in 2010. We, um, we increasingly offered programs for the companies, not just for the women, the top companies, which recognized um, companies that did well with their gender representation was launched in 2009. We formed a partner program where we brought companies in to share practices with each other. BRAID was an educational program to help universities increase their participation of female students. Some of our impact was less direct. Um, Valerie Taylor, who I mentioned before, 
along with several of her colleagues, founded the Tapia Celebration of Diversity in Computing, modeled on Grace Hopper, and then founded Commandit, the Center for Minorities and People with Disabilities, modeled on Anita Borg. I still serve on the board. So those are some of the examples of programs that survived. There were so many other programs, some that I loved that just didn't make sense to scale or they didn't have the impact. And so at the heart of the work that I did at Anita Borg was a, a creativity. What, what makes sense? How do you um, decide whether or not to add a program to what you're offering? And you got to love the picture. There's a lot of warthogs in Africa. And this particular warthog is going into an ant eater hole that he has co-opted. I thought that was a pretty creative thing to do. <laughs> but going back to the organization, understanding your creative processes is, is really important for any organization because every time you spend time and energy on one program, there's something else that you're not doing. And so you really do need to embrace creativity wholeheartedly and make it part of your everyday practice. And so in, just to summarize my advice, find the courage to take risks and go for it. Develop the confidence to pursue your vision develop effective communication of all your ideas, embrace curiosity in all that you do, ensure creativity is at the center of your work. I can guarantee you that if you take these, this advice seriously and you make it yours, make it part of who you are, you will have the career of your dreams. And I, I challenge you to take a minute and close your eyes and imagine empowering yourself to do the best work of your lives because you believe there are no impediments. And then open your eyes and look around you and imagining, imagine empowering the people around you to do the best work of their lives because they believe there are no impediments. And once you take that in and believe it, I would make that I would go and make it so. Thank you. And um, I we have plenty of times for questions. Um, this is this slide. So in the PDF you will get you could there's actually a link to all the pictures from Africa. You can look at them, they're quick and easy to look at. Um, you can get my survey report or you can reach out to me. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back to Regina, who's going to help us take some questions. Or I'm not actually, I'm not sure who's doing that, but somebody uh, is. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, smarter people than me are going to be doing that. Okay. So, Dion, are you doing it? Or yeah, something? Dion and, uh, and um, the other young lady that uh, yes, uh. <laughs> thank you so um, and uh, yeah so but Telly that was so brilliant and thank you so much for sharing that um, I know I I definitely felt incredibly inspired and uplifted so with that I'm gonna uh, hand it off to these wonderful young women to uh, host the questions sure if anyone